Is this where I want to be? I think it is. All right. Many moons ago, we had started talking about disturbance and how disturbance ultimately affects. Happy afternoon, everybody. Good morning. I don't have my brain together today, so please do excuse me. Um, so we have been talking about population tolerances um, and dispersal in abundance. Okay. And so we spent the first part of this really talking about what do these terms mean and how a couple of core concepts affect these things. We talked a little bit about abiotic factors, so how things like climate and pH may affect the range that species may live. And then we added... <clears throat> competition um, and other biotic factors and talked about how these may also affect a species distribution or species range. And so then at the very end of class, many moons ago, we started talking about disturbance and succession. Okay, so the idea that large upheavals, whatever may cause them, um, can be beneficial or sometimes disadvantageous to species distribution. Right. So classically, we think about things like succession, which is what's on the screen here. And this is where we left off on class. Which is the idea that intermittent upheaval allows for sort of a board wiping of a particular ecosystem. So large, bullyish, or highly competitive organisms that dominate the ecosystem are pushed out. And it gives other organisms the opportunity to exist. Okay? So the example that we had talked about which are really common for plants are wildfires. Now we tend to, as humans, have negative connotations with wildfires, but most of the time, when not suppressed for 250 years, wildfires are generally quite natural and are small, right? Because not huge things are dead. And so small wildfires will go through and wipe out a small area like this. Okay. Now, largely the major thing that a wildfire is going to destroy okay, are these heavy duty trees. Okay, that are probably 100, 150, maybe 200 years old. Okay, but the key feature with that is they're the canopy. And okay, meaning, as we even look at this image, right? Okay, they're the big bushy things. Okay, so if you imagine being on the forest floor, okay, they're the things that are blocking out all of the light. Okay, so from a competitive standpoint, hugely problematic, big bullies. And they also tend to have some of the largest root systems. Okay, so again, from a competitive standpoint, big old bullies. So by taking out a handful of these guys, it gives a lot of other organisms some hot competition, at least for a while. Particularly large hardwoods are slow growth trees. So they'll come back because they're still heavily competitive organisms. Okay, they're big, they're tall, and they do their thing. But particularly things like grasses and shrubs, fast-growing organisms. So they'll be able to come back really fast. And some plants, some grasses in particular, have seeds that are initiated, busted open, by the heat of fire. <clears throat> so these events okay, that may damage or kill other organisms provide opportunities for others. Well, it ends up very cyclical in nature. Right. 
So periodic events. We see this with flooding, large windstorms, <clears throat> right, any of these sorts of things. We'll do the same, same thing. Okay, now we don't mean catastrophic events, right? Like the wildfires in California. Not what we're talking about, right? <clears throat> that's a whole that's a whole different ball of wax. Okay, so any of these things are called disturbances, right? We're disturbing the area, we're shaking things up. Okay, so the key here is you might imagine, even as we're thinking about these sort of California wildfires, is there's really a sweet spot when it comes to this. Okay, we call it intermediate disturbance. Okay. The idea here is if there is not enough disturbance, right, we'll take a peek at this graphic, our x-axis here is how much disturbance are we getting? The further to the right we go, the more frequent, okay, or the more intense the disturbance. All right, our dependent variable, we're going to look at overall species diversity. Okay, in most cases when we're doing species diversity, this is both species abundance and number of species. Anybody see what we're looking at with that? Okay, so here's the key. If I don't have enough disturbance, and this is something humans tend to cause. We don't like wildfires to happen. We don't like flooding to happen. Okay, so you don't have wildfires for 250 years. Okay. Then you get reduced diversity. And why? Seems safe enough. Why is this a problem? Okay, what's the problem with living behind the castle walls? So why do we see reduced diversity in really safe areas that have little disturbance? That's fine. <laughs> okay, so let's think about this for a hot second. Okay. If we are living behind the castle walls, <clears throat> we don't have anything abiotically bad happening, or at least extremely bad happening. You're still going to have a storm or two, right? <clears throat> so all organisms technically do have an equal opportunity. But let's think about something like this situation. Okay, what do you do if you're an organism that gets bullied a lot? Right? So remember our barnacle friends, right? The limpets got underneath them and kept pushing them away. So I live in a really safe area, okay? But limpets keep telling me I can't live there. Is it going to go great for me as a barnacle? No, right? Because nothing's telling the limpets they can't stay there. Okay? So it's all well and good in the beginning, but the simple reality is if there's a really safe area, right, just like our succession, is in these safe zones, okay, what ends up happening is you start just accumulating a high abundance of a few species. Okay, highly competitive bully species, right? Limpets, hardwood trees. Okay, it's like a game of King of the Mountain. You guys ever played that when you were a kid? Right, everybody raced to the top of the couch and you elbowed all your siblings off and then mom yelled really bad. But it's like playing that game 
and no mom yells to stop beating up on your siblings. Okay, so however the biggest kid is, always gets to stand on top of the couch. All right, always have the high ground. Okay, so the biggest bullies always get to stay there because they're the most competitive. And so no one can tell them no. Remember what's key about that little bit of disturbance is every once in a while you get a fire or a flood, right, that wipes away the bullies. Okay, so at least every once in a while, everybody gets to come back and they get to hang out. Right? The bully gets knocked off the top of the couch, and everybody gets to run back and play on the couch for a little while. Right? Until someone gets poked in the eye. Okay, so we have a little bit of a flood every once in a while. And it wipes away all those bully limpets. The barnacles and the snails and everyone else can come back in and enjoy the safety for a while. And eventually the limpets will come back. Because they get to play too. Maybe they're kind of mean. And eventually no one will want to play with them for a little while. But then the flood will come back again. Whatever. Okay, everyone understand the difference between zone one and zone two? Okay, let's take a look at zone three then. There's clearly some dramatic problems with zone three. Yellow is probably not a good choice. Wah, wah, wah. Right. So in zone three, we see the most disturbance and ultimately the least species diversity. What's the problem here? We just said having a little bit of disturbance was a good thing, right? It keeps the bullies in check. Okay. Is that not what's happening here? What's the problem? Right. And so what's the problem with that? Right. So what we end up seeing here is the disturbance is too dramatic or they're too frequent. Right. And then nobody gets to play anymore. Okay. You got too rough. Mom yells and no one plays on the couch now. Go to your room. Okay, that's it. We're all done. Okay, so you're exactly correct, right? It's too much. Okay, so it's really difficult for species to be able to reestablish themselves. And a few can. Okay, you got a few toughies that can really hack it. Hey, the weird people in their bunkers or whatever, right? I'm not leaving. There's always a few animals like that, too. They don't mind or can do just fine. A few plants that survive fire no matter what. For example, that was a good example. Hey, but significantly less than in any of these other instances because it's easier to put up with a bully than it is constant death threats, right? All right, great job. Any questions about these?
from flashbacks. My brother pulling my hair when I was a kid now. Okay. Any questions before we move on? That feel good? All right, so let's look at some of the ranges and the limitations that go into how far a species can live. So we've kind of already started to talk about these a little bit. When we're talking about dispersal limitation, we're talking about areas that a species should be able to live, okay? So not because of abiotic factors, right? Normally it's not that it's too cold. I want to live there, okay? But something is keeping me from either getting there or staying there. Okay, there's some sort of problem. Okay, so we call these dispersal limitations. I'm here, okay, I want to be in Texas, for example. Why can't I get to Texas? Because it's a perfectly suitable habitat. There's the right temperature, the right amount of rainfall, the right amount of vegetation, and why am I also not there, my population, right? So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about dispersal limitation. Okay. Classically, habitat fragmentation, okay, disconnects between habitat are huge roles in this. So natural versions of this, we might imagine mountain ranges. I know there's no mountain range between here and Texas, but let's humor it because I decided to ride this bus, so we're gonna ride it all the way. So if I was a mountain goat and I wanted to live in Texas, but I live in West Virginia, but there was a huge mountain range in between, that would be very difficult to cross for most organisms, right? Same thing with large gorges, right? Huge riverine systems, right? These types of geographical features, okay, are often natural habitat fragmentation. Okay, I live here. Doesn't matter how beautiful the other side is, it's extraordinarily difficult to cross. Okay. The example I have up here is the hoary bat, because look at him, it's adorable. Okay. So we consider okay, Hawaii, it only has one native mammal. Hawaii is a nightmare for invasive species. We'll talk about that in later units. Okay, but mammals are not generally native to Hawaii, right? They're islands in the middle of an ocean, okay? Not super easy for organisms to get out to the middle of an ocean on their own accord. The stuff that's there now, we picked up and freaking carried, okay? The one animal that is there naturally flu. Okay, so the habitat fragmentation, the dispersal limitation for most organisms when it comes to islands, okay, giant ocean. Okay, so not only distance, but crossing a saline body of water like that is not user friendly. Okay. Humans have also made this extraordinarily difficult. Okay, we consider the effects of cities and roads, highways, and even for large animals. Okay, elephants and lions, for example, have been trapped in relatively small for their body size areas. Okay, we know certainly that small animals have a heck of a time with it. Right, we can picture like turtle crossings, how problematic that is. Right. So new age, we think about hagman, <laughs> habitat fragmentation often is, is well human driven. Right, animals that used to be able to go from one area to another now are unable to because people exist and broke their spaces up. Um, one of the big issues with the wall that Trump wanted to put up, 
is putting up. I'm actually not super sure about the answer to that. Um, is it actually fragments or cuts in half um, several major habitats? Because um, even though we consider Mexico and the United States two separate areas for people, they are or whatever. For animals, they're not. Right? This is an imaginary line. Um, so it cuts major habitats like sloths, for example, just randomly cuts major habitats in half. Oh, there's sloths down there, man. Um, and so it becomes really problematic. So then the other thing we want to consider here is climate change effects. Okay. So what happens, what's the big issue with climate change right now? If I'm an organism, what's happening to my habitat with climate change? So what's happened in West Virginia in the last 20 years? What's the weather and climate been like here? You guys are all old enough. To it's gotten warmer, right? You guys have gotten less snow than you got whenever you were a kid. I know I have less snow from where I come from, from when I was a kid. Okay, So it's gotten a lot warmer in each individual area. And that's like the easiest, most tangible concept. So if I am an organism that's delicately sensitive, a very low tolerance, flip back here. So we think about like these guys, right? These guys are very tolerant to the cold or not tolerant to the cold. And there's organisms that are tolerant to the cold or not tolerant to the hot. So if I'm very not tolerant to heat, if I'm in an area that's suddenly getting warm, what do I have to do? No. What do I have to do? Okay, it's gotten warm here. Where do I need to go? Somewhere colder. And where's that probably? North, right? So we see a lot of these rain shifts, right? It's easier for animals than it is for plants. Um, plants do move, right? They drop their seeds. The ones that are more south die. The ones that are more north live. And so you see this actual slow movement of it um, in a very surreal fashion. But it is slow, as you might imagine. Right? Animals just walk. Hey, but, right, I'm delicate, right, it's too hot for me, I need to pick up and move. And okay, now I have a problem, though. I can't get across some habitat fragmentation barrier, a city or a gorge or whatever it is. So now what? Die? Those are my choices. Right, so these are the kinds of issues that start to come up. So we know what needs to happen, but how we actually do it and what needs to occur are extraordinarily difficult. Okay. Any questions about that before we move forward? The risk of already gotten a little preachy. Okay, so let's talk about other ranges. Okay. So some of this that might seem familiar. So the difference between endemic and cosmopolitan. Okay, and so again, how these play into range limitations in the first place. So endemic are organisms that are really local. They're only found in small areas in the first place. Okay, so the example I usually talk about this is like possum. Okay, so we have possums here, okay, pretty much in like the eastern-ish half of the U.S. That's it. Okay, some of them in South America as well, and that's it. Okay, when you say possum in England, they have possums there too. It is not the same animal. Okay, there's this cute, like it's inviting you to a tea party. Ours is mean, is going to mug you behind a dumpster. Okay, it's an entirely different animal. Same thing with badger, by the way. Like, I don't, they get all the cute animals. We do not have cute ones. Um, so those are endemic, right? And there's a whole bunch of species that are like that, right? Possums, just like it was a nice visual one. 
right? There's break into bakeries and get fat and look cute and chubby. Everyone's probably seen that meme by now. If not, I will definitely dig it up because it's amazing. Okay, ours, like, I've literally been chased by a possum in the middle of a parking lot when I was your age. Like, they are not nice animals at all. I'm pretty sure there's an entire thing in Bob's Burgers about, like, Little Miss Trashmouth. Are they raccoons? That, like, Linda's obsessed with. There's a whole family in the background. Like, Little Mrs. Trashmouth. I'm not making this up, guys. I swear. I'm finding these clips this afternoon. Okay, cosmopolitan on the other side, right? <laughs> our organisms that are wide in distribution. All right, so the example I have up here are rats. Right? So there are a handful of species of rats, and those things can live anywhere. They are not picky. So when we say, like, brown rats here, it is exactly the same as the brown rat in the UK, which is exactly the same as the brown rat in Serbia. Okay, the one that caused the plague, it is the same rat in the entire world. It'd be all the same. And humans also are like this, so that we kind of cheat. Not like we're super adaptive, we're just... Uh, bully, so we modify our habitat rather than modifying ourselves. <clears throat> All right, so you can also imagine if I have a very small range in the first place and my range is now fragmented, keeping those populations together, right, or moving those populations around is going to be much more difficult than being a brown or a Norway rat, right? Move, losing or fragmenting one small part of that population is less of a problem. Because there will always be more Norway rats. They look much less maniacal. All right, here are some other issues that come up with this, right? Despite the fact that we consider major issues, cities have gotten in the way, there's a massive gorge in the way, right? In addition, right, even though we want to think here from Texas, maybe, is the suitable habitat we want. And we already know, right, there is not a mountain range, right, between here and Texas, at least one that's going horizontally that would cut us off. All of the habitat range that would be between here and there would not be perfect. And we can picture this, right? Even if we took the cities out, right, everything between here and there would not be the best habitat in the whole world for a given organism, right? Habitat itself is patchy. Okay, so as you move, think about driving along. Even if you take out the human component, okay, this area has this kind of trees, right, but this area is a grassy meadow. Right, this area is naturally drier or whatever. Okay. As an organism, that is problematic. Right, particularly if I'm an owl and I roost in trees, right? or I'm a monarch butterfly, and I need a very specific subset of flowers, okay? So, patchy distribution can be problematic, okay? And this can be on a large scale, okay? Everywhere from West Virginia to Texas, it's not gonna be a massive forest, okay? Or it can be on a very small scale, okay? So within a forest, Okay, we're not going to be all the same poplar trees. Okay, you're going to get patches of different types of trees or different types of soil within that forest. Okay. So this patchiness, even with all of the stuff that we just talked about removed, okay, is a large driver of the habitat fragmentation, right? Causing struggles of organisms. And I've been very animal-driven 
But even if we focus on things like climate on the large scale and soil on the small scale, right, this is going to affect things like plants. The still feeling okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So let's take a break and do a little class thought project. So Thinking about the fact that we just said like all organisms right, are limited by some kind of habitat suitability issue. And thinking about what we know about amphibi egg, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds, okay, so four groups to think about. Let's think about all the characteristics that go into them. Okay. What groups, so we're going to try to rank them, are going to have the most lineages that are cosmopolitan? So we're going to try to rank them to most to least. So we have a couple of things that go into what causes issues for dispersal. And we talked about a couple of things that make organisms more likely to be endemic for or eh, cosmopolitan. Okay. And some of this you may need to dig back. If you took zoology with me, we talked a little bit about what are some of the characters of each of these groups. Right. And some of it intuitively what are characters of each of these groups, what's going to make them more successful than others for being cosmopolitan or not. Okay, so we'll give it a hot second or two and then we'll come back and talk about it.
Okay, so let's look at this. Um, so I do have a, a graphic for us to talk about, of course. It's one of our favorite things, right? Um, but before we flip to that, let's think about what are the things we think are the most important as we look at the list that we have up here. So when we look at our organisms um, or orders, um, what characteristics did we think was important when we were sifting them down? Okay, so movement's really important. So thinking about that, what was some of our better ranked groups then? Birds. Because of that business, my guess would be. Okay, what else? Did we take into account? What do you mean by that? All right. All right. So, who did that benefit or create a disadvantage for them? They do. Some do. Can you say that again? So this is correct. So reptiles and amphibs are ectotherms. I spell that right? Amph yeah. Okay, both mammals and birds are actually endotherms. Birds do fly south for the winter, at least some of them do. A lot of that has to do with food. And the same reason that mammals hibernate, right? It's not a lot of food in the winter. That joke that I think someone made about Maine being a deserted wasteland. Right. It is cold, but mostly there's not a lot to eat or do, so no one hangs out but me, I guess. Okay, so these are really good tips. Is there anything else that um, you guys took into account as a major factor? All right. Okay, so when we look at the list, Okay. Clearly we used like what you just said, right? Amphibians and reptiles are the lowest on the list. And why are they probably the lowest? The temperature regulation, right? That's um, a huge problem. Okay. They're really limited to what locations that they can go to. They can only be in places where it's not going to freeze all the time. So they can be in parts of North America and parts of South America, parts of Egypt, Asia, um, and parts of Egypt, right? Um, right. But we can't go anywhere really far in Europe, really far in North America, can't be in Antarctica at all, right? We can be in parts of Australia, but not where amphibians can't go where it's super dry. So we're really problematic. Okay, the next up is mammals. And not a ton more than reptiles. What are mammals probably limited by? Ocean. Movement, exactly. All right. So we do have much more of the birds. That's because we both have our temperature regulation and movement. Excellent job. All right. So my favorite. All right. Let's hit us a graph. Okay, so things that will benefit organisms with diversity. Okay. <clears throat> so we have a lot of different pieces to look at here. 
So what is our, we got time for this? Oh yeah. All right. What is our independent variable here? Right. This is our diversity. And note that this is a per hectare one. Right, and that's an important thing to keep in mind, right? So this is a density driven one. Because these aren't total numbers. This is in a per hectare space. Okay, so what is A telling us? Right, good. So, right, this is really focusing on that limited by movement argument. Excellent. Okay, so in a given area, right, so by density, you're going to have a lot of organisms that can't fly because they can't move around. Okay, but if you can fly, okay, you're going to move around. You're not all going to be stuck in one area. Can this make sense to us? If you were to pull your backyard for species, okay, you are going to see a couple of birds, a couple of butterflies, but the bulk of it, not going to be flying organisms, right? It's going to be mice and a crap ton of ants, right? Those types of things. Maybe if you're lucky, a deer or two, okay? But most of them are not going to be flyers. And the flyers don't stick around that long, right? So if you can fly, you can move. And you do move. Excellent. All right, great job. Let's look at B. B is a little bit heatier, right? So what is B telling me? It does, yes, the same x-axis. So we're still looking at total diversity per hectare by density. You're close. Be careful at the numbers we're reading. What's the biggest number on here? One kilogram. Watch your units, right? So these are the big animals, and these are the little animals. Right. So what are the big animals doing? What were the animals that were flying doing? They were moving around, right? There weren't a lot of those. So what are the big animals doing? They're leaving. Feels counterintuitive at first, right? Why would that be? Why would the bigger you are, right, we've got a nice gradient here. Why would the bigger you are, the more likely you are to move around? Bam! Okay, the bigger you are, the more food you need to eat. Okay? And so in order to feed yourself, you need a wider range in order to consume all that food.
Okay, consider something the size of a mouse, like this guy, versus the something the size of an elephant. Okay, the sheer amount of space the something the size of an elephant needs in order to consume the metric tons of food okay, is just big. Okay, so they need constant movement to get the food and to not deplete the resources. So even though you got to move that big body, okay, they're doing it to have that large resource pool. Okay, whereas little guys like little mice are going to have really small territories, right? Which to them feels really big. Okay, but same thing with your ants, right? Your ants hill, very tiny bodies, right? They're probably never going to leave four squares in front of your house okay, or your kitchen. Okay, so the smaller you all, smaller you are, okay, the less distance you're going to need to go in order to get all that you need to survive. Okay, that's it. We're going to end class there. You guys did a great job. This was a tough graphic to look at and understand.